Ladies and gentlemen, once again of Hashtag Nation, I have a very special guest joining us for our special rapid fire segment today. Matt Perino of NYUp and Syracuse.com. He gives you the Buffalo Bills news with an MMA approach. And today he's going to try to TKO uh, Hashtag Nation and their questions that were coming into us. Uh, a little bit of a background of the, the rapid fire segment is we, we poll Hashtag Nation to ask us a bunch of Bills questions. And usually it's Paul and I doing it. And it's kind of a misnomer with the rapid fire because those are usually our or longer segments mm -hmm. but um so hashtag nation came in with a litany of questions obviously everyone being on quarantine they have time to sit at home and think so i decided to bring in uh matt perino to answer some of your guys questions i mean if you're not following him if you're not uh, you know on twitter following him getting his articles his information is is second to none please go give him a follow all of his stuff will be in the description of the video as well but first and foremost matt how you doing bud I'm good, man. I'm good. <clears throat> I'm 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 ready for you know this quarantine to be over, but it looks like we got a couple months ahead of us here. So, uh, just trying to make the best of the situation, enjoying the time with the family. Um, but uh, you know, a lot of things. That, I mean, it's a perfect time for it to happen between you know free agency and the draft. There's for for the Bills community, there's a lot for us to talk about. So that's good. Oh, I think. It I think a lot of things have been amplified in the Bills community because when you sit at home and you have time to think about all this stuff and then no moves have been made like recently right. because of the quarantine, uh, everyone's like, oh, wait, wait, do you think that the Bills would trade Josh Allen and get Cam Newton? It's like, it's crazy some of the things that people are coming up with, but, uh, uh, but it's, it's fun. It's fun to, it's fun to get out. And, and this is your second time on, uh, on hashtag sports. So once again, yeah, hashtag... I was telling, um, I was telling the rock pile guys, uh, I gotta get in the back seat one of these times once the quarantine is <laughs> over. I wanna I wanna go for the ride. I get do do the Bills chat in the car. That's 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 next level. I, I gotta ascend to that level. Oh my god, it's so much fun. It's so much fun. <laughs> we definitely gotta get you in the car, man. Uh, so I mean, uh, uh, so without any further ado, we do have some uh, some questions from hashtag Nation and uh, just some things that have been going around. And I think that Matt can give us some excellent insight on this. So first and foremost, right out of the gate. Um, and Brandon Bean even touched on this a little bit on Thursday. You know, Buffalo Bills, everyone seems like they've already won the division. They have the AFC East locked up. They have a first round bye, you know, and all this other right. stuff. What are, in your opinion, what's the realistic expectations of the Buffalo Bills going into 2020 if they even play the season? Yeah. So I put out a story earlier this week and, and basically power ranked the AFC East and you know, probably would surprise some people, but I had the Patriots at three behind the Bills at one and the Miami Dolphins at two. And the reason I say that is I understand everything that Brandon Bean was was talking about uh, this week and and why, you know, they're going to kind of slow play, you know, the, the dynamic change in the AFC East because it, they haven't beaten the Patriots yet. Um, so I understand the, the logic. But if you look at the roster from top to bottom, I'm not just talking about Tom Brady in New England. They haven't added any playmakers around whoever's going to be the quarterback there. The options that are out there, you know, I think the highest ceiling option out there right now for the Patriots is probably Jameis Winston. But mm -hmm. at the same time, you talk about, you know, the the downfalls of his game. And I don't know if that really meshes with the kind of style of football that, that uh, Bill Belichick wants to play. And on the defensive side of the ball, as good as that defense was last year, they lost two huge big cogs in that defense, in Kyle Van Noy and Jamie Collins. And I thought that that defense didn't look as good without Jamie Collins the couple years be beforehand. They get him back in the fold. They look like a completely different defense and a, a terrorizing defense, allowed some, some people to do different things. So I just think from top to bottom, that roster, I still have a lot of questions about that roster. And all of the additions that Miami made, mm -hmm. you go back to week 17 when, you know, the, everything was on the line for the Patriots. I mean, if you go back to the to how that season ended and how how they got eliminated in the playoffs, if they beat the Dolphins in Week 17, we could be talking about a completely different scenario in the AFC playoffs. I mean, if the if the Patriots end up with a with a bye, and wh who knows what'll happen. But the Dolphins, you know, I think that they're for real. I think Brian Flores is for real. They they don't have a quarterback yet, and that's where I think some people are probably on the fence about buying in. But I think that he's doing something similar to what Sean McDermott has done in Buffalo and built a culture. Uh, they moved on some pieces. Uh, everybody thought it was crazy that they moved Minka Fitzpatrick. Maybe he just wasn't a fit in the culture mm -hmm. that they were trying to build. I mean, I think everybody had the same questions early on with Sean and Brandon when they moved on from Marcel Darius, a former top, top draft pick. But it just wasn't going to fit what they were doing long term. So I like 
the expectations for me are the Bills should be at least expectation wise. And I'm not talking about Vegas odds. I'm talking about if you are actually evaluating these rosters. I think the Bills should be the AFC East favorite. I think that the excuses have been uh, stripped away here with the additions that Brandon Bean has made. I think they're going to be better on defense. I think they have the best wide receiver group, at least trio in the AFC, maybe the entire NFL. I mean, John Brown was an elite receiver last year, and now he's going to be probably the best number two in the league. And Devin Singletary led the league in yards per carry. Um, A lot of everything in Buffalo and and Miami to a lesser degree is trending up right now. Mm -hmm. And whereas I feel like I'm waiting for a spike from New England, I just haven't seen it. And I'm not even talking about the Jets because – of Adam Gase. Once Adam Gase is out of that situation, we can start to seriously consider the Jets. <laughs> we can start taking them seriously once the, once Adam Gase is out. And I feel for Sam Darnold, man. Like I would love Darnold Allen to be this epic rivalry, uh, you know, a throwback to Jim Kelly, Dan Marino. You yeah. Know? But the guy's just being sabotaged there. And I still think he's playing pretty well at times in spite of what's going on with their, their culture and their organizational structure. But I think the Bills are sitting pretty in this division. Well, it's interesting that that Sean McDermott didn't have to do something that that Flores had to do, which is um, you got to assert who who's in control of the team. I mean, Fitzpatrick could have been a guy that was a, a locker room guy that was like people look to, and then like Flores trades him for a first round pick and saying, "Listen, it's my team. It's not his team. It's my team. I don't care how good you are on this team." I'm going to assert what I what I came to do, and then this is going to be my team. So they're going to know that very, real soon. Uh, Bill Belichick did that really early with, with uh, Drew Bledsoe. I mean, they just paid him a huge contract. They just get, gave him extended. Once he finally realized that uh, Brady, Bledsoe, I can get four solid players with the contract that we're giving Bledsoe. Let me do right. that. So as far as the AFC East goes, though, I, I, I tend to – I tend to agree with you as far as the Miami Dolphins. Everyone likes to you know write off what they're doing, but they're 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 setting a blueprint and they're following it. And Flores, I don't know how much he absorbed from Belichick being up there, but it seems like that's the path that he wants to go down, especially with some players following him down there as well. Um, Fitzpatrick, man, Fitzpatrick always beats the Patriots at least once. You know he's beat him with the Jets, he's beat him with the Dolphins, he's beat him with the Bills. It's it's going to be so interesting because the. The reason why, though, I don't really write off the Patriots and the evil empire up there in in New England is because of Belichick's success against rookie and like one or two year um, uh, quarterbacks. So you're going to you're more than likely have a rookie in Miami. You got Josh Allen and Sam Darnold, which you which you admitted. I'm I'm a fan of Darnold, but with Gase, I just don't see it. You know, I just don't see it going on. But then you got Allen there who. You know the Senator Palpatine up there in New England figures you know young quarterbacks out, and that's what he does. No matter what it is, he does not care if he's going to win a game 17-13. He gets the win. He does not get. He does not care. I think with the amount of picks that they have and how they're able to reload, uh, this is the year that they're going to try to figure out was it Belichick or was it Brady. And a lot of people are going to be surprised at the answer and going to be surprised by the Patriots this year. I mean, in my opinion, I think they're going to be. I put them a little bit ahead of the Miami, but I, I'm also a guy that said that the Buffalo Bills would be winning the division at nine and seven this year because of their West Coast schedule. Um, right. No, so. I mean that's something to consider too that I don't think I'm paying as much attention to. But I just think that why I'm not as worried about the schedule as some might be is because of the way that Sean McDermott coaches this football team and gets them mm-hmm. ready to play week in and week out. I think that you know he'll present that early on you know, once the team comes together as the challenge of the year and put them up against it and have them have it be something they have to embrace and and beat. And this is a very, he's built a a team full of competitors. They're going to look at that West coast schedule and be like, man, we're going to beat that. We're going to, we're going to, we're going to split. We're going to, we're going to have a winning record on the West coast, whatever it ends up being. Mm -hmm. And so I trust in that you bring up Miami and what they're doing. Right. And, Mm -hmm. and a lot of people like to compare their, their spending spree to some of the the really bad team building uh, you know, regimes of the past. You can even look at it in the immediate two year history here. Look what uh, Matt Patricia did last year in breaking the bank five years, ninety million for Trey Flowers. Right? You get Kyle Van Noy, who I think is as good of a a, a, a pass rusher or you know at least a backfield disruptor as Trey Flowers. And they're getting them on a four-year, fifty million-dollar contract. I mean, everything that they've they've spent 
uh, outside of Byron Jones, I think is pretty responsible. Yeah. And I think that you still need to build some pieces. I mean, the Bills went out and gave Star Latula a contract. And obviously, Jerry Hughes has a pretty sizable contract. Trent Murphy, they gave a pretty good deal to. And, you know, so on and so forth. Uh, Mitch Morris made him the highest paid center in the league. You've got to spend some money, I think. Yeah. And it, but you got to be judicious with it. You can't just like, you know, you pay somebody a five year, $90 million contract that's going to come in and guarantee give you 10 sacks a year. And I don't, I never thought Trey Flowers was going to be that outside of, uh, out of New England. So yeah, yeah I, it's going to be fun to watch. I mean, people tell me all the time, like, man, you picked a perfect time to come back and cover the bills. And, and <laughs> I really did because it's like all of a sudden the pendulum is shifting in the division. And Oh, by the way, the bills are actually probably the best roster in the division now. So that's, it's fun. Yeah. I saw it on, uh, I think it was first take. I think Max Kellerman and uh, Stephen A were going back and forth, and Kellerman was very heavily favoring the Bills. He goes, you look on paper right now, the additions they had, uh, who they are able to bring back, oh, how the team was. They were 10-6 and six last year. They were doing all this stuff. But, I mean. I it, love that, by the way. Respect that? to those guys. I love Stephen <laughs> A. Smith and Max Kellerman. Max Kellerman is probably, you know, he's probably the predominant voice in boxing yeah. in the country. Like, he's great. Stephen A. Smith an OG basketball reporter. Neither of them should be talking about football. But, you know, and Stephen A. Smith should never be talking about MMA. And it, it goes on and goes on. I, I respect those guys. They're great reporters. They do a great job in that show. But, like, if you're going there for, like, them breaking down Bill's moves, I don't know, I, I don't know what to tell you. <laughs> no, it was great to see them go back and forth because, obviously, they just had the, they just had the discussion saying Stephen A. still thinks New England's the team to beat. And, right, and, and right. Max was like, well, you know, you look at the Bills up and down. They have an emerging roster. They have a great coaching staff. And, all. and you know, it was it was great to hear them actually talked about on a national stage like that. So Definitely, um, 100%. And I think that that's – it's funny. I've, I've noticed a bit of a, 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 a lightning from the critics uh, of Josh Allen over the course of the last six months. You know, <laughs> I think people got a chance to watch what that guy was all about late last year. Yeah. Um, even in the Houston game, I think you go back and watch it, and it's been on NFL Network a couple times in the last few weeks. I don't think you leave that game uh, as uh, unimpressed with Allen as you probably were on first watch. Because if you're a Bills fan, you wanted to win that game, man. Like, you wanted to go out there and, and, and beat Houston, and it was there. Uh, for the taking, and I thought he made a lot of good plays in that in that game. He made a couple bad ones that he wa- obviously wants back. But if he if he just flips that ball a little bit better to Dawson Knox, I mean, we could talking about a di- completely different situation in that game. Oh God, I got flashbacks to the 06 Rose Bowl when he did that. <laughs> I was thinking of Reggie Bush. <laughs> That's what he yeah. And he even admitted it. He said it. He's like that was my uh, that was my Rose Bowl moment. <laughs> Poor oh guy. my God, that's hysterical! All right, you know, shift the gears. You know, it, it, and ladies and gentlemen, go down in the description uh, at, at the conclusion of the video. You can follow all of Matt's links uh, to uh, to his, the, the website as well as his Twitter. Uh, he's always given a great insight on everything, um, and I, I'd like to, I'd love to get your insight on this. So, with with the Brandon Bean being a mover and a shaker. Uh, you know, what is the likelihood, I mean, of Brandon Bean not having a first round pick, having a pick at 54, doing something? Because Paul had talked about this on our show and he actually got a lot of hate mail for it, but he talked about <laughs> packaging your second round pick and Beasley to try to move up into the 30s, like maybe maybe with uh, Indianapolis's pick at 34. What is the likelihood that Bean will actually try to move up in the second round uh, come draft time? Yeah. Yeah. Um... So that's interesting. I never even thought about, you know, moving one of your actual pieces that you're counting on for next year. Because yeah. still think, you know, Beasley was an important part of this offense last year. And I think he could be even better with Diggs now. But yeah, I, I think the possibility of moving up makes a lot of sense. I don't think to move up from where are they at? Did you say 44? No, they're at fit. They're at uh, Indianapolis, yeah, Indianapolis is at 34. I think 34. So 30, to move up, yeah, yeah, 34. Okay, so to move up 20 spots, I think the real conversation has to be, what are you moving up for? And so, like, if you have like an edge rusher that falls, like say the LSU's kid, uh, Caleb on Chase, and falls out of the first round, that's something where I think the Bills probably pretty enamored with that guy from mm-hmm. conversations that I had uh, down in uh, Indianapolis. That's a situation where you evaluate the board and you're like, how do we get up to get this guy? Um, I think you probably package maybe a second round pick next year, like a two and a second next year to move up to get that. I don't think you're probably going to move Beasley because I think you're in a window. And I think that you spent a whole year 
it's not only about having Beasley, you know, that player in your offense. It's also about the the rapport that he built, not only with Josh Allen, but with Brian Dable. Brian Dable got a chance last year to figure out how do I best use Cole Beasley, and then of course in the Houston game, he gave him like the I think the least amount of targets of the season. But <laughs> so there goes that point. But no, I I think moving up is definitely in play. I think it comes down to how these guys are going to like be graded on their draft board. And if you have, you know, shout out to Joe Biscalia last night over at the athletic, he put out a really cool draft article where he almost took you a couple picks uh, by couple picks, like throughout the whole draft and kind of went through his ideology about what Brandon Bean and their front office will be thinking. And I thought it was a cool exercise to get you thinking, okay, if this, you know, a uh, handful of players are there in this range, what do I have to give up? And who else do I have maybe as potential targets that I can maybe sit back and wait? Okay, I have 10 picks until I'm going to pick, and I have seven guys that I would want at this pick, and mm-hmm. I have them about the same level. Well, you're not going to give up draft capital to move up if you have that many guys. So you can kind of see how the board plays out a little bit, and I think that's really intriguing. That, you know, They're going to they're gonna have their board. They're going to evaluate it after the first day to see how many targets they still have left. Mm-hmm. And then as you move towards 54, I think that – to be honest with you, just knowing you know how probably difficult it was for Brandon to give up that number twenty two this year, yeah, I don't anticipate him him giving up a lot in a deal. But if he can move up three or four spots to get a guy that he might think isn't going to be there at fifty four, that to me makes a lot more sense. Um, what did Paul want at the Indianapolis pick that he was willing to trade Beasley for? Was there something particular? Jonathan Taylor. Yeah. <laughs> Well, like, we'll get to that, full, I guess. Full we'll disclosure. That, full guess. disclosure. I really think Paul did it to annoy me and annoy Hashtag Nation, number one, because okay. it was. But he, Paul gets very enamored with running backs, and he really right. he really likes running back. The problem that we had with the, with the discussion, he goes, well, because you have Diggs, now you have a formidable guy to play opposite John Brown, which you didn't have in 2019. I said, okay, well, who's going to play the slot then? He goes, Isaiah McKenzie. I go, well, it's not Ooh. just a – he goes, it's not just a plug-and-play thing. Like, we were going back yeah. and forth, and we had a litany of hate mail in our comment section, which was fine. I mean, I mean, Paul had to deal with it. I wasn't touching – I told him I wasn't touching the comment section because he wants to start this fire about trading Beasley. I'm not going to be part of it. But right. the idea, though – um, I could get behind. So if you want to go with a player and your second round pick to move up, like I understand it's customary that you would trade a for a future pick in order to move up in that round. And the tough part about Indianapolis was they do not have a first round pick either. And that's going to be their first second round pick. So the, the, the capital for that would even be higher than it would right. a normal team that already picked in the first round. You're jumping a lot of teams. Uh, his goal was, was to get Taylor to pair with Singletary, but he wanted to jump uh, Detroit in the second round. Uh, so he was trading up with, he, I think we actually settled on the Giants. So he, like Bean was going to call Gettleman, try to rekindle that. He was going to trade a second rounder in Beasley. With Joe Judge being there in, in in New York, he's a guy that could use Beasley coming off of that Patriots tree. So in, in, enticing to that. But I, I wasn't. I, I agree with you. I wasn't on board with trading Beasley because of the chemistry he was able to develop last year, because of that type of EP system where the Patriots run it. You need you need a Beasley player in there, and I don't think McKenzie's at that level, or you would have given him more than just a one year deal. So, yeah. in that respect, I could see Bean moving up for his guy, especially too uh, if the Buffalo Bills happen to trade with the Giants, if they have to go from fifty four to thirty six, which is a big jump. You're, you're skipping Carolina, which Bean loves doing anyway. So, right. um, I'm so intrigued to see. I don't think he stays at fifty four. Whether or not he trades back, gets more capital, or he trades up, I don't see him staying at fifty four because I think he he'll just want to move. I right. really think he'll. Want He's to move. definitely getting impatient after that first day and not having to pick one hundred percent. I just don't think that there's tons of value in trading up for a running back period, okay. and I think that you know obviously Taylor is a special you know prospect. I mean to to watch his some of his tape and then to watch what he did at the combine. I mean. Man, it looks like the real deal, right? So I get, I kind of get the in, you know, Bills Nation part of Bills Nation that gets enamored with guys like that. But, you know, they got their guy. They they got their feature back. I mean, Devin Singletary is, you know, he led the league in yards per carry last year. And, you know, take that role on next year even more so. And, you know, 
do you really want to go out and spend that kind of asset on a running back that you're going to ask to touch the ball eight times a game, you know, and be your kind of, your, your kind of, uh, you know, in case Devin Singletary goes down type. I just think that there's other developmental, if you're looking at not just this year, if you're looking in the, in the you know, next year and the year beyond, I still think you need to develop some positions on this team. I still think yeah. cornerback, edge rusher, potentially even interior defensive line are something that you have to consider. Starlo Tule, not getting any younger. He's going to move on. You got Vernon Butler, who I think that they're hoping can maybe uh, be the heir apparent, if you will. Mm -hmm. Uh, But we haven't seen him in a Bills system yet. So how is that going to work out? So there's a lot of different positions, and you know how much the Bills want that big nickel. I know that Saran Neal has been really developing in that role over the years. Um, But I think if they can get a guy like Kyle Duggar, even Jeremy Chin, uh, it, to, to pl- they're, they're day one plugins there. I think that they would become that Buffalo nickel like off the jump, and I think it would really cut into tr- Taron Johnson's playing time. Uh, who, by the way, he struggles to stay healthy anyway. Yeah. And I thought he was. I liked Taron a lot. Like I really enjoyed my conversations with him. I thought he took a step back in, in his sophomore season. I don't think he was as effective as a tackler. And part of me wonders because of the phys- physical nature of how he plays the position. Yeah. If that's just always going to be in his head, like man, every time could just be like a game-changing injury. So I think that there's guys you move up for. You know, I think the Dawson Knox thing in the third round last year made a lot of sense because of the run that was happening at tight end. Yeah. But at running back, you're probably going to be able to get one of the top five guys at 54. So if you're thinking, I want a running back high up in this draft, it doesn't make sense to me that you would trade up to get one particular one where I feel like that 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 group of five is so close together and – um, you know, I think that there's, uh, to be honest with you, I think they might even like Edwards Hilaire probably more than Taylor if, if I was looking mm-hmm. at a, a type. So, no, I'm not, I, I don't agree with that, but I do, I definitely respect the thinking and the outside the box thinking because, man, wouldn't that be a shocker if they dealt easily as part of the package? Move up that the would be, that. like I said, I think Paul just did it to, to rattle some cages. And it's, it's funny how he does that sometimes. Uh, so, you don't think all, all the running backs will be gone by 54? So, I think. Three or four will be gone by okay. by 54. And all we'll right. see what that ends up being. And obviously, that's been a fun little conversation we've had all week yep. um, You know, on social media. And listen, people always DM me all the time like, oh, man, like going back and forth. It, that's what this is for. That's what Twitter is for. Like we're always going to be going back and forth and talking <laughs> about different, you know, lines of thinking. I don't care if somebody c- comes and try to call me out. Like it's – it is what it is. Like yeah. um, I think that to just say that – 2018 was an anomaly is just just a a lack of awareness i mean it happened two years ago for a reason and you know i think that and also i think that something that happened two years ago is much more relevant to me than anything happened four five six years ago because the nfl is an evolving league i mean the the ideology like front offices change i mean look at look at the new york jets how many times did that front office change over the course of a three-year period boy it's been i mean crazy Exactly. So different ideologies are coming in on, you know, on a consistent basis. And, you know, it's an evolving situation. I think that because of how highly regarded this, the top of this running back class is, there's going to be a little fear there. If one of these guys goes in the first round, and I really don't think that there's that one is not going to go before the Chiefs at 32, because the value is going to be so high there. Yeah. Um, they can, they, you know, they don't have a lot of holes. Um, then you're going to see probably a run on running backs. And, and so, yeah, I think three or four probably go. You almost the when the first one goes off the board, everyone else in the league is going to flinch. That that's that's right. not the Giants. It doesn't have Saquon Barkley or Ezekiel Elliott or Christian McCaffrey. You know what I mean? So right. everyone else is going to be like, oh wait, is this when it happens? Is, is it starting now? Because then we got to right. start making some phone calls if this is what it's ha- what's going on. So, I mean, I like the idea of Chin and Duggar, be, just because of the fact that this team for two years now with basically the same parts you know if you, you take out a, you take out a Kyle Williams you insert at Oliver you know it, pretty much from that respect you, you still have the rotational uh, corners with Levi Wallace and, and Kevin Johnson but for about 30 plus games now this defense has been together and it's, right. it's it seems like it's unprecedented in today's NFL that you have that many pieces together for that long they're gonna have to I think 
institute something that's a little bit of a different flavor and a new, new wrinkle. And I think Chin and or Duggar does that for your defense where it introduces something that you're not normally used to seeing. Whereas you take out the Swiss Army knife, which was Lorenzo Alexander, and you put in a Kyle Duggar. They love that big nickel. They love running the two linebacker sets, putting four on the on 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 the line and letting them go hunt and playing seven in coverage. That's what they like doing in order to generate a pass rush and generate pressure. And at times they happen to, they happen to, you know, call up, dial up some blitzes. Leslie Frazier is very creative with that, but having a Kyle Duggar there will, you don't know where he's going to go. You have no idea what he's going to do. He's like a Rover back in the day. You know, we run like right. a five, two monster uh, back on our defenses back in the day. So I'm really interested to see what the bills decide to do with that 54th pick and how they're going to, whether or not they'll trade up or down. But we were uh, we were definitely talking about um, we were definitely talking about running backs a possibility and a guy's name that's been coming up recently in the news has been um, you know T.J. Yeldon Brandon Bean made a, made a point to talk about him what what if any could be T.J. Yeldon's role in a Brian Dable offense if they decide to pass on taking a running back in the second round or third round. Yeah, this is a really cool, nuanced discussion that I, 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 I'm i glad that we're having because, I, you know, people, I think, I understand you're at a point with this Bills roster where it's been built so, I don't want to say flawlessly, but efficiently, mm-hmm. that you have some room to take some swings at some some spots where you could really bolster a position, right? And even though you have a Devin Singletary, you know, adding a, a, a top edge or top option at running back in the draft, you know, is enamoring for a lot of people. Even though you had John Brown and Cole Beasley have career years, going out and getting a Stefan Diggs just takes your offense to the next level. I get all that. My contention is that from all the conversations we've had this offseason now with Brandon Bean uh, and Sean McDermott in Indianapolis, I just think that there's a lot more confidence in the building in TJ Yeldon than I think there is in the fan base. I mean, you go back to 2018 and you really, you look at his, his career in Jacksonville as a potential, you know, number two option. The production's been, I think, impressive. Like mm-hmm. I would like that kind of production as my backup running back or as my number two running back. Now, a lot of has been made about Frank Gore, you know, being a downhill uh, in between the tackles type of runner. Well, I don't think that that was necessarily the kind of compliment you wanted for Devin Singletary last year. I don't think it worked. Every time he came in the game late in the year, everybody kind of like, you know, filled up the box and knew what was coming. Yeah. You look at San Francisco, and I used this as an example yesterday, Raheem Mosert, Matt Breida, and Tevin Coleman. None of those are Frank Gore model running backs. Nope. They're all multifaceted, can do multiple things. They all have speed. They can all kind of run in between the tackles or go outside the tackles. I think you need a multitude of, you know, skill sets to be a part of, of the mix that's that's what i'm looking for and that's what i think tj yeldon brings he's a above average pass blocker he's a great uh receiver out of the backfield and i think he's been fine as a running back in between the tackles outside the tackles whatever you want you're going to be leaning on devin singletary to do a lot of that and i think that you know I, i i do now with all that said let me back this up i do really like the idea of having a Mark Ingram on your roster, a high round draft pick, and then going out and getting an Alvin Kamara to pair up with him. But where did the Saints get Alvin Kamara? Do you remember what round? Uh, Fourth, third or fourth? Third, third Third. round. Okay. Third round draft pick. So that's, that's that kind of range that I'm kind of looking for. Yeah. Did the, did the bills get Devin in the third round? Of course. But he proved to be an you know an upper echelon starting option. So now you want to you want to supplement that with value somewhere in the draft. I, mm-hmm. I think you want to spend a higher asset somewhere else. And I think T.J. Yeldon gives you the ability to take a running back later in the draft. If they went into this draft without a, a, a viable option underneath Singletary, then I think that you really consider one of the top guys in this draft to pair with them. But um, I don't know. I I, I just think that. that there's been a lot of uh, put some respect on TJ Yeldon's name, I would say, I guess. Uh, I think he they really liked him in the room. I think that every time Devin Singletary talked about Frank Gore last year, and they're very close and they had a special relationship, he always made a point to mention TJ Yeldon and the kind of teammate that he was and what he brought to the room with his experience and the kind of looks that he was giving in practice. He, you know, he's 
he's still got a, a pretty high level skill set, even though he didn't get on the field last year. And I think the Bills might have learned last year that, oh, hey, maybe we made a mistake. Maybe he should have been on the field a little bit more. Yeah. And it, uh, hashtag Nation knows my, <laughs> I have defended that guy. And every week I was always banging the drum during the season. All right. Maybe this will be the week TJ Yeldon gets used. <laughs> maybe this will be the week because we know how much the Buffalo Bills went to three wide receiver sets. And it, it's so interesting to me that to have this. And people were clamoring for height at the wide receiver position last year. Okay. We need to, we need to activate Duke. We need to activate Duke. We need to get him on the field. Well, a lot of people forget that Yeldon is six foot two. And, uh, you know, a couple of years ago for Jacksonville, he had more receptions than Zay Jones. I mean, at the <laughs> running back position. So right. I was, I was thinking of, and, and, and I, I was, I was pre- preluding it with this. I said, listen, the idea of Yeldon is so intriguing to me as another facet of this offense. Cause if you want to go three wide receivers, okay, let's just say, just for example, you decide to go 11 personnel. You put TJ Yeldon in the backfield on your left-hand side. you got Brown and Beasley on your right-hand side. You have Knox and Diggs. You motion out uh, Yeldon to Diggs and Knox's side as a defense. What are you doing? Right. What can you do? You could you could run a quick dart past the digs. You can have Yeldon kick out. You could do a bunch of you got Knox over there. There's so many things that are going to confuse the defense. Putting a TJ Yeldon in there and helping Josh Allen at the same time because a lot of times when the Buffalo Bills would go to those five five wide sets, but they'd have a running back. As you know, one of the tips up tip offs is if if a cornerback's going out with the um, with the running back, okay, it's zone. If, if a linebacker runs out with them, it's more than likely man. Obviously, defenses can co- can cover it here and there, but it, it, it helps your quarterback out in Josh Allen. The the idea and the abilities that you have to expand your offense with T.J. Allen, I was a, such a big fan of. Now, if you get a guy that has his similar skill set in the draft in the fourth, fifth round, that's fine. Okay, you want to do that? You want to do that. But like you said, you have the insurance that – and the same insurance you had last year to go get Devin Singletary because you signed Yeldon two days before the draft. You had right. the ability to trade up and, and probably take a shot at some of these running backs last year because of TJ Yeldon. And I, I just think it's he's so intriguing that of the things you can do offensively, like my coach's head is like looking at all the things I can do with TJ Yeldon. And, and, and you know what? I love the fact is, you know, the fumbling thing to me is an anomaly. I mean, people are like always like, oh, well, he fumbles too much. Now when he's catching passes out of the backfield, he's not. Right. He's never doing that. So you only uh, have one lost fumble in 2018 on I think 150 touches. So yeah. that might be just played up a little bit too much. Oh, but yeah. you know, I, I mean, get it. I mean, if you had a fumbling problem, you weren't playing very much for for Saban, and and the guy right. played at Alabama. Right. So right. <laughs> okay, and uh, switching gears a little bit, let's talk. Uh, the elephant in the room, Matt. We got to talk about the elephant in the room because uh, there's three guys: Trey White, Matt Milano, and Deion Dawkins talking about their contracts. I know what I think. I know what hashtag Nation. We've discussed with hashtag Nation, Paul and I. Um, there's certain things that, uh, because it's such a dead time and everyone has so much time on their hands, everyone's kind of worried about the whole Trey White. We had mentioned earlier in the episode about Byron Jones. You already have Xavier Howard down there. You have Stephon Gilmore in the division as well. The Jets are throwing a bunch of money at a bunch of corners. Uh, we know Trey White's going to be expensive, but of those three gentlemen, what do you see going forward in the uh, in the contract talks for for those three players specifically? I think that Dion and Trey are are Trey's a, a a sure thing. Like, I mean, it could be twenty million, and he's gonna they're gonna they're gonna get him <laughs> done. I just think that he's a product of Sean. He was Sean's first pick. He. Yeah. Sean is the defensive back whisperer back there, and he's got a really great relationship with with Trey White. And Trey White's like, you know, I think that they 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 seen what the Patriots have gotten out of Stephon Gilmore at that kind of price tag, like elite cornerback money, and it's been well worth it. Yeah. And so I think that Trey Trey gets done. I think that Dion gets done because you're not going to have to give him top five money. Probably, you're still going to have to give him fifteen ish a year, mm-hmm. but how are you going to find another left tackle? Like, are you going to be drafting early enough in the draft to get one? Are you going to be able to sign one? Are you going to be able to trade for one? If you're going to trade for one, how much draft capital do you have to give up? Does, you know, I just think that, you know, they if they can come to a reasonable deal, and who knows? Dion's a, a, a process guy. He's a locker room guy. Mm-hmm. I could see him maybe even taking a little bit of a hometown discount to put the Bills in a good situation. 
because of all the extra stuff that he does in the community and all the different little things that he has going on here. So we'll see. We'll see. And Milano's the tough one because I think that out of the three, he's the most replaceable. And I know that that sounds weird, Mm -hmm. but they can probably take a couple pieces, developmental pieces, and string things together and replace what he does. Um, now, I'm not saying the defense will be as good without him, but I'm just saying at the cost at what you're going to might have to pony up for him. I mean, if we're talking 13, 14 a year, that's going to hurt. Like, that's going to hurt big time. So that's another guy that if you can get him on a reasonable deal, I think there was, um, uh, I think, a couple out there. Uh, I can't remember the linebacker that signed this offseason that was uh, I've been using as the, the example. But, you know, some – you know, you just got to put things into perspective and you know, you have a, a deal coming up in, in a few years with Tremaine Edmonds yep. and you just have to, and Josh Allen too, but for, you know, to put that kind of money, if we're talking 13, 14 a year on Milano, and then you're going to have to give Tremaine Edmonds top middle linebacker interior money, man, that's going to be a lot at the position and you're, and you're paying AJ Klein, you know, yeah. at least for 2020, you know, six, six and a half million. So, uh, I think that, uh, We'll see how this thing goes out. I think that Brandon, the one thing that you can take to the bank is that Brandon Bean is really good at making this all work. You know what I mean? Like, I think that, you know, this will be the first test of like the end of, you know, first year contract guys that he's got to pass, but everything else in terms of cap health and, 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 and depth uh, roster health, he's really been good at, you know, in his four years now in Buffalo. So I, I would trust in that. And I would say if you're asking me to power rank them, I, I think that Milano would probably be the most likely to not get re-signed. But, and you also have to think about the, the kind of comp pick that they can get back if oh, yeah. Milano walks. Because their, their team is pretty much set now like for next season. So if you go into this year and you let Milano play out that contract and he leaves and he signs you know, the biggest linebacker contract on the market, you could be looking at a third-round pick back. And so you have to start like thinking about that. And, and so I think that Brandon Bean's always been looking forward to the time that he can finally get some comp picks back uh, <laughs> on, on some guys. Um, so it's tough, man. It, Cause Milano, I think he's a fan favorite. He's a guy that, you know, where, you know, he wears it out there. Like he, he puts it all on the line every week. He's an undersized guy. So he's really like fiery and he flies around and he makes plays and as a pass rusher and against the run and coverage, um, but it's just a position that I think that they've proved in Milano that they could draft and develop. So it's a decision that's, that's going to have to be made. Well, it probably happened when when Milano. Like I agree with I agree with you one hundred percent that he's he's definitely a fan favorite. I mean, it's not the first time Bean and McDermott went after a Boston College linebacker. If you guys want to Google Luke Keekley. Um, mm-hmm. Funny well, thing, <laughs> Keekly and the boys. Uh, I saw Tommy Sweeney shared on Instagram. They had a little Boston College uh, Zoom video. There was um, like ten of them on there. Twelve of them: <laughs> Keekly, Milano, Sweeney. It was a it was a little Boston College party. So, oh yeah. God, was Flutie there? I did not see. <laughs> I did not see the Doug the Doug the Doug Flutie uh, um, on the call. Well, I mean, you know what though? You know what? This draft could signal some of the things that you've been talking about, Matt. If they decide to go for a Duggar, and I mean, I mean, we talked about Milano when he got hurt a couple of years ago. It seemed like Poyer was playing that role for him. He was coming down in the box, and he was, you know, he was flying around the field playing next right. to Edmonds. And you know, a lot of people start to talk about here and there about, oh yeah, we need a first round pick. We need a first round pick. This is last year. Uh, well, and you looked at, you looked at the. Um, the Raiders, they got three first round picks. Look at look at what you just talked about. You talked about the uh, having the ability and the financial capital to sign both Edmonds and Allen, who are essentially the quarterbacks of your two sides of the ball. That's only two first round picks. Some of these teams like Miami and, oh, and well, Vegas now, but they had three first round picks. How do you plan on signing these guys in four right. years, five years when it comes along? Uh, I, I, I love that you brought up the point that how high is your pick going to be to replace the Deion Dawkins? Like if you end up like going in the tank and you have a top 10 pick next year, okay, maybe you can even try to consider to move on from Deion Dawkins. But like you said, the off the field stuff. That's a, that's a side question for you. That's a side for me? Yeah. If, if, they're, if they're a top 10 pick in 2021, 20, is are Brandon and Sean back? And also – 
are they both back? Is Sean fired? Like, how does that all play out? That's a that's a conversation that I don't want to be the to bring the the vibe down on this Bills oh, mafia no. off season party at all. No. But you bring up a good point. Like, we might have to start, you know, thinking about that. Well, they, they, I think that they're fine. I think that they're safe oh, yeah. no matter what because of the relationship they have with the Pagulas and you know the, the the job that they've done to to fix this franchise and two playoff appearances in three years mm-hmm. but man that's something that we'd have to talk about if we're talking about a, a bottom 10 team after this crazy rebuild Ooh. well you know as well as anybody how much a gm and a head coach are linked to their quarterback and usually when they right. when they get into office that's the first thing they do is they try to get their quarterback and if they don't have their quarterback how patient is the ownership in order for them to get their quarterback listen i just don't have my guy yet i mean whaley bought time a lot because right. he's like, well, let me get my guy. Let me. If, by the time I get my guy, then I'll be able to show you that I'd be able to develop a winning season. He should have so, waited longer. <laughs> <laughs> he's uh, but I I I I 100% believe that the the futures of Brandon Bean and and Sean McDermott are indelibly tied to Josh Allen's performance and how he how he ends up coming out of the gates and the scapegoat and all of this is, will be Brian Dable first. If that domino falls and the Buffalo bills have not one, but two seasons where they're under under, you know, under producing, then mm-hmm. you could start to say, wait, what's going to happen with McDermott? What's going to happen with being here? Uh, they've been able to do like all these great moves, but it hasn't manifested into wins. So that is, that is such an interesting topic, but I always tie the quarterback, the GM and the head coach. They're all indelibly linked. If one falls, they're all going to fall. So, um, if, you know, if Josh Allen's a success, then, you know, I, I always thought that McDermott anyway, you know, bought two years of his contract because he was, he was able to break the drought. I always right. thought that whatever his contract was, it just added two years to it. Yeah. <laughs> so, yeah. um, but it, it's so interesting. Like I like Deion Dawkins. I like, uh, I mean, the, the, the craziest part about this whole thing is that Trey white, um, they don't have to do anything and they can keep Trey white for the next three years. Not even, right. not even worrying about it. They could, they right. could, uh, fifth year option, franchise tag, franchise tag. It doesn't matter. And, well, that, that'll get weird with the franchise tags. I don't think that that will the relationship. Oh will no, go I don't think that. it'll but, get there. But it, that's an. But option what's there. interesting is I really think that Trey's team, his representatives, and him and himself, they're gonna want to wait till the final hour because that that number is just gonna keep creeping up over yeah. the next you know twelve to eighteen months. And so he's probably sitting there like, hey, if you're going to give me whatever it ends up being, if it ends up being like a five year, a hundred million dollar deal, say something like crazy like that. Yeah. And they're going to guarantee like 70 million or something crazy. Right. But like, yeah. that's, what give it to him. that's what he could be eyeing. And he'll 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 take his sweet time to get that kind of deal. And so. I don't know if that's something that the Bills would give or, or be down to do if, for a defensive back, but um, he's important, man. He, I think that he is – he's the most important player right now, and this can change on that defense. I think Tremaine Edmonds can become the most important piece on that yep. defense, but he's still got some work to do. And even down the line, Ed Oliver could maybe throw his name into the hat if he becomes the kind of pass rusher they envision. But, you know – I think they really want to keep Trey long term, and I think that number is going to be. Do you, do you think his team is waiting on both Jamal Adams and Marshawn Lattimore? Oh yeah, I don't think that the he he knows that he's he'll get more than Lattimore as long as he continues to play the, at the level that he played that last season. So I wouldn't sign a thing before Lattimore goes. It's so funny because like you got to think like the agents for both of those guys are both going. Did he, yeah, did he sign it's, yet? It's like that. Uh, did you watch The Office? Yeah, yeah. When they had the one episode where they were playing the uh, the who killed guy, and they're all at the end with the guns like this, that's kind of what all the agents are doing. They're just standing in a room, just like, oh, what are you doing? who's that's gonna funny. who's gonna flinch first? Right. <laughs> oh my god, that's phenomenal. But uh, ladies and gentlemen. Um, uh, devoting his time today. We're so happy. Go down in the description. You're going to see all the links to find Matt and all of his information. Uh, you know, this is your second time on hashtag sports doing the rapid fire segment, answering the questions from hashtag nation and bills mafia. Matt, we can't thank you enough for coming in. Uh, Anytime, man. what do you got coming up on on my up and, uh, and on your Twitter or any kind of streams that you got coming up for the people? Yeah. So I'll give you guys the exclusive next Monday or this Monday coming up. I'm going to, I'm going to be one-on-one live 30 minutes on our Facebook page uh, with uh, Kevin Connors from ESPN. Super, 
Bills Mafia super fan. Nice. So we're going to go for a half hour, talk about all things Bills uh, over on there. So check that out. Follow us. Uh, we're Buffalo Bills on NY Up uh, over on Facebook. Follow that, and you'll be able to check that out on, on Friday and also share links from all my social platforms. We're going to be pretty draft heavy. Uh, we started our series on 10, uh, 10 targets at each uh, draft position the Bills have. So we did 54 and 88, yep. and we'll come out with uh, the fourth rounder. Uh, pretty shortly here, and, and we'll move all the way to the seventh round and try to get everybody ready to go. I mean, this is coming up, and there's not a lot else to talk about, so <laughs> we'll get uh, we'll get dialed into this uh, this draft thing. We could be bunkered in for uh, for a couple months here. So uh, oh, I can't wait. I can't wait to. We're we're going to be doing a draft show, so I'm going to have the same Zoom meeting up for everybody as well. So we're we're going to have a lot of fun over here at hashtag Sports, ladies and gentlemen. And I told you off air, by the way, and so yep. I tell all hashtag Nation Nation here. Yep. Uh, I got to get on the car. That, that's that's my next. I, I, I'm I'm kind of trending up like the Bills. You know what I mean? <laughs> I, I got the, this is my second show, but next I got to be in the back seat. I want the full, uh, what's what's that cash cab uh, vibe going on, and uh, we'll talk some bills uh, in the car. Oh my god, you are definitely the next one coming on the Sunday drive, and we'll definitely book Beautiful. you for that, man. Yeah. That's pretty awesome. So, ladies and gentlemen, all of his links are in the description. Go down and follow him. And as always, thanks for riding.